I'm Val Johnson. Thank you so much for joining me for Interludes Extra. Check us out and enjoy. Hey guys, it is Tuesday. What time is it? Michael? Tuesday. It's Tuesday. That's what time it is. And this is an extra, extra special edition of Interludes Extra Talk on Tuesday. Today, instead of talking about whatever's going on in the news, so this is why we're not talking about that volcano that just erupted or World War III, we're talking about something important, the Fugees. Yes, the Fugees. The Fugees are apparently back, and this is huge news. Uh, Enough for us to think about what the Fugees mean to us. The idea of going to see the Fugees in concert And also, uh, when we go retrospect in terms of music, where do the Fugees fall in terms of the history of music? Uh, Which are all good questions and they'll all be answered today in this very short and very tight half hour of Interludes Extra Extra Talk on Tuesday with Valerie Johnson. Valerie, we're talking about the Fugees. Uh, When I say Fugees, what comes to mind? What first comes to mind for you? Refugee. Refugee. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that's how Wyclef started the group, right? In 1986, uh, one of the first early interviews that he had, uh, mm-hmm. well before they made any fame, he talked about the name of the group. Mm-hmm. That, uh, you know, as a Haitian American, uh, it was immigrants, but immigrants are always looking for refuge. And really, oh, yeah. people, all people, this is a universal thing. We're all looking for some kind of sanctuary or refuge. And so that name developed out of that idea, that concept of being an immigrant coming to America and being a refugee, the Fugees. And you had that representation in this group. You had a group that was culturally diverse at a time when hip hop was pretty narrow and um, not very interesting, actually. I- let me let me jump in here. I do want to say that all three of the members of the Fujis One, are two, all three. Haitian. <laughs> <laughs> all three are Haitian, Haitian American, Haitian natural, natural, natural Haitian. Uh, I think uh, at one yeah. point, I believe didn't didn't Wyclef try to run for? A, Ooh, a, let's not get into that now. Let's not get into that. Okay. That's not one of his best moments. <laughs> I know have, he tried to. We, know he tried to do something politically. Yeah, he did have the Haiti. Uh, he did have the Haiti uh, head wrap on, on for the Global Citizen concert, which is kind of the, the most recent time that you know you and I have seen the Fuji together. We, we yeah, wanted we, we yeah wanted we wanted to we wanted to kind of um, jump in on their their reunion. It's been 15 years since they performed wow. on stage. 15 years. The score came out in February of February 1990. 13. Yeah, 1996. What was that? February 13th. It was a February great 13th. Back when 19- people bought, you know, CDs. A, a CD and uh with some folks it was also issued on a record album because people were still DJing on records. I know I was DJing on records up until about ninety five, ninety six. So I you know, I was doing uh, something. Okay. okay. But I will I will say this. Um the one thing that I was so impressed with when I first saw them and this is going before the score this is going on their their first cd blended on reality i was thinking wow i know the girl where do i know the girl didn't know the two men didn't know prize didn't know why clef but i was i was focused in on the girl and there's i don't know there's very there was very few uh women that were trying to you know there were very few women you can name them on one hand how many women kind of established and themselves they are uh, the five, <laughs> the women. And are. Uh, okay, Queen Latifah, right. uh, MC Light, um, Yo Yo. Three. Three, okay, uh, Moni Love. In the middle, where she's at? She's in the middle. And 
for that fifth one. Um, oh, a group. But we're gonna we're gonna go with a, 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 a singular uh, female rap artist. We're gonna go with Little Kim. Okay, I'll I'll stick her in there because I feel like Little Kim came before. Hey, excuse me, I'm so sorry. I'd put her in there um, barely because she came after after the surgence of of rap in the late '80s, early '90s. She came ninety. Five ninety six after Biggie, and my is my math off? Is my is my numbers off? I'm okay. Well, not, not a little bit. Oh. but if you're talking about people that that came in, I mean, I don't. I don't you're talking about a certain time period that, when that... they established when when rap was starting to get its get its its real push, and a lot of times, a lot of the people that came from the late 70s or early 80s, a lot of folks were male. We started to see some female M MCs and they showed up in the late 80s and early 90s. And the four that come to mind are <laughs> Queen Latifah, okay. MC Light, um, Yo-Yo, and Moni Love. See, I know I think, there's more. See, but, yeah, I, I think that you and I are gonna have to that's okay. I think we. I think it's okay to agree to disagree. Hip hop. I think okay. the hip hop that you were getting was more mm -hmm. churchy hip hop, and I was getting the raw stuff. So I was hearing the kid. Yeah. She was. She was nasty. She was little. <laughs> she. She had this whole kind of different attitude. You had little Kim. You had Foxy, and you had someone. I remember who, Foxy. I remember when she first hit. I remember the song she came on with uh, with Jay Z. But not to get off on on everybody else. Lauren Hill was the standout to me in the Fugees. And I, I was pointing this out to you probably a night or two ago about Lauren Hill. She came on at the age of 13 on the Apollo and saying, um, who's loving you? Barely got through the song. She was booed, but then they started to clap for her as her voice was developing and all of that. But she had this big voice. You could tell she was nervous. And you know, a lot of a lot of pop stars or people that got you know larger started off on these competition shows. Aaliyah was on Star Search and she didn't win, and there's other folks. But but Lauren was the standout, and I think the thing that stood out to me was that a lot of a lot of a lot of folks saw her in Sister Act Two with Whoopi Goldberg, and this was before the Fugees hit. Am I correct, Michael? Oh sure, yeah, That's yeah, little... yeah. Because uh, I, I believe I believe Sister Act Two came out in ninety two, ninety three. Blunt and on reality, that album was released in ninety four, and okay. so I so was here's just where we get, here's where we get a little bit technical on it, which okay. I think is worth it. Uh, okay. okay, you're right, absolutely. Blunt and on reality released in ninety four. The group, the Fugees, record. London on reality, though, in 92. No, so, two years earlier. At the time that, uh, no, this is significant. Here, here's the reason. Mm -hmm. So at the time that Lauren goes in and is, is seen, you know, in Sister Act 2, she's already in this hip hop group. Right. Okay. Right. So everybody is looking at her like, oh, there's this singer. That girl from that movie, you know, mm -hmm. like she just blew it away. She's amazing. Mm -hmm. What a what a great singer. Well, that singer had a record contract already, but it wasn't for singing. Does, you see my point here? I got I got your point. I got <laughs> that, your point. That movie kind of helped to, in a way, propel who they were. It gave them a visibility because she had visibility oh that's the girl from uh sister act two wait she's rapping she wasn't rapping in that movie she was singing wait she can wait so the first time you hear lauren hill you know you talk about the apollo you talk about the uh you know sister act two she's singing she's singing i'm, I'm i was thinking she was I mean, a singer i'm thinking right? she's a singer yeah that's what you thought she's a singer now, now, since I didn't see Sister Act Two because they had Whoopi Goldberg in, and I'm allergic to her. Um, so, oh, so I saw 
the group, the song. Now their big hit, I guess, before um, before the score and the the incredible success of the score was the song, um, you know, the Mona Lisa song, Nappy Heads. But that wasn't when I first saw them. I first saw them do this other song called Vocab, this video for Vocab. And it was so different. It didn't sound like any other hip hop at that time. I mean, at that time, we're talking about the early 90s. I mean, the Dre Day sound has taken over pretty mm -hmm. much the chronic from the chronic, you know, that has taken over. Dr. Hip -hop. Dre, yeah. Yeah, West Coast gangster West rap Coast. Is, yep. is the, the thing. It is pretty much all of hip hop. You can remember it having such dominance that, you know, Snoop Dogg dared to do the video in New York, New York, comes into, shoots a video in New York and it's knocking down the buildings, you know, pre-9-11, pre, pre like, you know, he's knocking down buildings, he in the dog pound. You remember this? Yeah, I do. I do. Um, and, the, so what, they, and, and the one thing that I will say about the chronic and that, you know, the whole West Coast, it's it's weird how... I don't know. They dominated the airwaves from the time NWA hit in, in 86, 87. So I just, I, and kind of that transition, just Dr. Dre kind of going, you know what, I'm going to go in this direction. And thank you to uh, P Funk and, and those guys giving me but a it becomes, bit of my it becomes chronic commercial. sound. I Very mean, commercial. I, I mean, <laughs> that year, at that time, there was there were pretty much two albums in the early 90s that dominated. One was a hip hop one. One was a rock one. Uh, mm -hmm. Everybody had the chronic and everybody had Nevermind, which is also celebrating the anniversary, uh, 30th or something. 30th anniversary, anniversary yep. Yeah. So those are the wow. two things. And I mean, it took Puffy with Ready to Die and Vicky, elevating Vicky to the status to put New York to kind of counterbalance all of this kind of West Coast, you know, rap. So you have this East Coast, West Coast kind of machismo going on. And then, then you have out of, out of New Jersey? Jersey. What? Jersey. You have this trio, this co-ed trio mm -hmm. of Haitian refugees rapping over acoustic guitars and, and, and snare drums and like, what is this? I love it. And that's the same. <laughs> I mean, when I heard it, that's the same thing I thought. Like, whoa, what is this? It this doesn't sound like, like it was written by George Clinton 30 years ago, right? Maybe. It was a welcome change. It doesn't sound like a Diana Ross sample being looped over and over again. It this was is, a welcome change. <laughs> absolutely. It was. <laughs> and then, like you said, then, like, that girl. Wait, that's a girl I can see. She She's kept rapping. tilting your head. What? She's right. Yeah, because her hair. I mean, she had the kind of straightened, permy hair in in uh, Sister Act Two, and there she was on the screen wearing this kind of cowhide leather with these with these little fall away like uh, like uh, you know Josephine Baker curls in her hair and these thick lips, and it's like. Who is that chocolate drop? What is she doing? She's rapping. Is that the same girl that was singing in that movie? What? And then in yeah. the song that I'm re remembering, vocab, she does start singing. And then I'm just like, well, what is this? Yeah. Like, what is this? Is it so kind they, of cool? What is this? So they were they were assigned to uh, Rough House in 93. Columbia, Columbia Records, mm -hmm. and uh, they had been working on, I guess, they started in 1992 recording Blend and Norm Reality and ended up getting released. And I think, um, was Vocab their first single, or was it? Um, I Mona think Lisa? Vocab was the first single. I feel, like I, that, I feel like that was the first single because it, it had, vo it had it, singing it vocals. It hit the way they wanted it to hit. And then they mm -hmm. came back with, um, with Nappy Heads. And that sort of had some traction, but then they came back with the Nappy Heads remix. Mm -hmm. And that's what did it. Because yeah. in the video, if you notice the video, like the video that you see now, it, 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 it has these different scenes in it. 
So yeah. that that's that early, you know, Valerie, you know, as as a as a uh, you know, going in in terms of like music videos and early music videos, you would notice those cuts because a lot of times the artists sometimes well, sometimes the artists have a different vision with their music video than the director would. Right. And if they could afford it, they would shoot both and right, try to right. figure out which one is the one. There would be a version one and a version two of the same song, different video. And in this remix, you can tell it's like two different videos going on that are intercut, you know? Which or is fine. Which, yeah, which yeah, is which fine. is fine. It yeah. was probably a earlier mix of of Nappy Heads, which is not that one. That's a remix. Right. That so dude. what? And I yeah. believe it now. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So the uh, reason why I believe the Fuji's coming together um, now after a 15 year hiatus from, from forming on stage and then now the 25th anniversary of the score coming out these two albums, this is um, Blended on Reality and The Score, were the only albums released under the Fuji name. The only two albums. I mean, I know they had a greatest hit situation. What happened? Amazing. That's amazing. That's amazing. And that, uh, what I will say, The Score was released in 96. It sold, uh, according to uh, U.S. Billboard, they, uh, 22 million. And it was Worldwide. a... a Worldwide. Um, Worldwide, I think, million. Domestically, yeah. 7 million. Yeah, so Fuji La, uh, Killing Me Softly, which I'm going to talk about in a second, and then Ready or Not, which is what, which really became the, every time they would close a show, they would close a show with that song. I, I Talk about when you saw them in person, Michael. Okay, so this goes all the way back to 96. Okay. Um, I, I, I saw them, um, like just, uh, uh, barely a month after it was the, uh, 15th, March 15th was a Friday. Okay. <laughs> remember these days for a certain reason. You remember I, the exact date. I, wow. I, I, I had to look it up because I wanted to make sure I wasn't giving bad information, but I, right. I did check it. I did check it. And mm -hmm. that's a wonderful thing. Um, I did check it. It was a Friday. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I, because I had tickets i got tickets to the show and i kind of got a off ran, randomly um was dating somebody at the time and, and i got these tickets and i thought wow this would be a great kind of gift like a surprise to do that and it was really tight the fujis were playing at a place called the park west in chicago which is like about five minutes away from lake uh from the lake lake michigan lake Shore drive that area of the city uh, downtown place and then that place seats like really small it's just maybe a couple hundred people can fit in there um and the bill was this wow goody bob the roots the fujis okay so goody mob opened the show and at the time, they was dun 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 dun, doom, 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 doom. yeah. That knocking on my window, pow! Wow. Nobody, nobody now. <laughs> so that was back when CeeLo, CeeLo Green was in that group, was mm -hmm. still rapping. He had not started singing yet, really. At that point, yeah. Right. So they did pretty much all the music they had to do because they were a new group called Goody Mob. And Goody Mob came out because they were the, the newest group with the, the smallest catalog. And they were followed by the Roots. Yes, those Roots, those of y'all that are just coming to the Roots knowledge now. Yes, back in 96, the group that now is on TV every night on, uh, on NBC. It's Tonight Show. Hey, right. hey, hey, hey! <laughs> right, and they were just as versatile then. They were just as amazing then. They played all sorts of kinds of music. They were mm -hmm. able to flip it and be a rock band at times. They were able to be a classical band, a R&B band, a rap band. They, they were able to do everything musically because you had Questlove on drums. 
That was how the- did how did the Fuji sound live? The Fuji sounded awesome. And forgive me, but I believe that the roots may have stayed out for the Fuji's. Probably. It was it was like one of those kind of shows. It was a really mm-hmm. tight show. Um, so they came out, the three of them, and I was as close to them as um, oh my goodness. I mean, like at least a little bit more than six or seven feet away from the stage. It had to be. There were no like it wasn't like seats or anything. You just stand up there. It was a low rise stage. I, I I felt like I was almost on stage with them, and they oh, were wow. amazing. They were amazing. <laughs> and the thing is, and I'm cutting it off here. They had just received like the only radio success they had known because GCI in Chicago, which is the WBLS station in Chicago, pretty much. WBLS in New York, you mean? Right. That's the, yeah. that's the station that's comparable in Chicago, okay? Yeah. That was your big black radio station. They were still not really playing hip hop. Right. But the Fugees mm-hmm. came out with a song that kind of broke through. Because there was really no rap on it, it was just this girl singing. Mm-hmm. And she was singing a cover of Roberta Flack's Killing Me Softly. And it broke through on radio and they promoted the show. And he was this hip hop group that people who knew like me and like you would have known as a hip hop group. But their new song was this R&B-ish song. So it was on the radio. So they were getting getting popular. So it was hard to get those tickets. Those tickets got snapped up quickly. And I think in retrospect, that was one of the best concerts I've ever been at and and this is including some Prince shows that was just it was amazing to see those three groups back to back to back that was the alternative the ant the antidote pretty much to what was happening on the west coast and what was happening up in New York there was the wow. it was the, the 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 answer to the Dr. Dre and Puff Daddy kind of you know dichotomy of the music it was this new thing and it was amazing. When did you see the Fugees? Oh gosh, I want to say after they hit big. Um, I think um, if I'm rem- if I'm remembering correctly, I think they had a um, they had a, a backstage they had a shot at um, Essence Essence Music Festival mm-hmm. in New Orleans. Okay, and um, they weren't on the main stage. They were on what what we would call the super lounges. So they were like the Fuji's is on the super lounge, and if you are if still establishing yourself as a as a as a as an artist, you usually are in the super lounges. But because it was no room to see them in the super lounge, they end up going to the main stage the following. Oh night. wow! Okay, that was kind of that was kind of, that was kind of weird. But um, I had never seen so many people like lose their mind for um, for uh, Lauren's vocals. Uh, one thing I'll I'll say I do not like remakes. I have a tendency you have to do something very um, unique to a song to to remake it. I uh, there's very few artists uh, Luther Vandross. He 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 was. Uh, you know, known for remaking a song, and you're thinking that's a remake. It sounded like an original Luther Vandross song, but he would just do his own thing to it, and you're like, oh my gosh. And then uh, you had other, you know, phenomenal artists that would remake stuff. Uh, Phyllis Hyman, uh, Stephanie Mills. Just it's it's like a it's like a yeah. list of people that have, and 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 I'm I'm mentioning these people in, on purpose because vocally, these guys. You can't you can't hold a candle to them and and Lauren, touching a 1973 release of Roberta Flack's "Killing Me Softly." My mother told me that she used to hate that song because she used to hear it and would get morning sickness or whatever was happening with her at the time. And I was like, "Ma," so I don't like that song. But she, I remember my mom listening to the Fuji's version and she was just kind of going, "That beat is interesting." She did say that, but the one thing that I will say is. The Fugees made that song their own. Like you mentioned, Michael, like you mentioned, it was Wyclef coming in with that 
one time, two times, three times, just, you know, and it you're like, oh, okay. And the and the and it you had kind of a uh reggae tempo to it and it just switched it up and it, you just kinda ha- it, it I remember the original song just having a depressing feeling to it. You listen to the original s- you listen to these lyrics and you're thinking, oh my gosh, this guy is not even paying attention to me. And I'm doing, he's killing me softly by not saying nothing to me. And I'm all upset. But the Fuji's version, you kind of, you kind of doing a rock like, you know, all right, he's killing me softly, but I'm rocking, you know, hard with the, with the beat. So it's like, yeah. ugh, just great vocals. So Lauren, if no one noticed her in Sister Act 2, if, if people forgot about the Apollo, if we didn't notice Blunted on Reality, the world noticed the remake of Killing Me Softly and the song Ready or Not. Those vocals, that's her. That's well, her. I, I, think, I think you, you touched on something really interesting there um, about the fact that she could take something that would have otherwise been seen as kind of down or depressing or lacking some kind of a, uh, of a, uh, oh, I don't, I, I don't know what the word is for it, but, but that she can do that and kind of flip it and, and it, it bring this kind of sunshine or light into these darker songs and these darker themes. And I think that was one of the things she continued to do. She was still able to do that uh, with the Fugees, uh, with mm-hmm. the success that she had as a solo artist. I mean, some of those songs were right. incredibly depressing, but you could listen to them uh, multiple times. I think that um, that's that's a, a gift. That's a real uh, amazing thing. You know, that's like why you listen to a blues singer because not because they make you feel sad, it's that they make you feel better. You know, Amen. she could like take something su- sad and, and I empathize with your pain, girl, but you know, you feel better after hearing it. That's, that's yeah. what yeah. I think they, that was one of the keys, the secrets, secrets to their success. I mean, the other part was White Club, who was not yeah, my favorite for- person in the world, but he I- certainly was a genius musically yeah. to be able to do um, like killing me softly and flip it in that way, like almost and- flip it. In that way and bring this kind of different r&b world maybe it was a, like a world beat like puppy was good with the disco you know <laughs> take your hits in the 80s yeah. you know it sounds so crazy he was able to take like those 80s songs and sample them and trey was taking you know p-funk parliament funkadelic and sampling it uh and but then why clap is taking this whole kind of world sound the sound of the islands this kind of like natural sort of you know diaspora beat and, and bringing and, in hip hop and, and hadn't and been if, there before the same way and if you if you remember now that you're mentioning him as a producer um a very young group out of houston called destiny's child had a song called no 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 and the original was okay it was slow but he touched it and did the remix and everybody was dancing to it. And you are like, Oh my goodness. Um, another one, uh, Carlos every, Santana, every, Carlos every, Santana. That you remix. Know Carlos Santana is. is. That remix. And I'll go back to that. That remix of no, no, no. I mm. mean, he brought out something in there. There were four girls singing. Four in girls. That but yeah. after that, that remix, there mm. was a clear lead singer to that song. Yeah, it was. I mean, that was different. I mean, he mm-hmm. took a song because he was at that point like the golden child at Columbia. And I believe um, uh, Dustin's child at that time was through CBS Columbia. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. So he got them. They gave, you know, <laughs> they gave him that group and said, you got to do something. We got a girl group. I mean, right. it, he did that. He brought out like, oh, so Lisa, who's the big charge? Oh, we'll give yeah. it to that Nose girl, and she took it, and she took yeah. that song, and she took that group. And as I and, and as I had mentioned, Carlos so, Santana, that Carlos group, Santana, when he comes back, also Columbia, also Columbia product, you know, Columbia mm-hmm. Records, Supernatural, 
that Wyclef, and it's not even Wyclef, it's like people Wyclef brings to Carlos, right? Right, the product, like who are the product? Like, what is this? You know, who are these guys singing this song? What? Maria, Maria, what is this? I know, I know. And the, I, I, think, I think the Fugees was kind of half hoping, and I don't know, and I was kind of half hoping this for them, if you remember how New Edition, um, after they got with Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis and did Any Heartbreak, uh, they all broke off and did their own solo projects and did other stuff. You had Bell Biv DeVoe, you had uh, Ralph Tresvant, you had Johnny Gill. Um, was there anybody else? Yeah, so people did their own stuff. And then they, and, oh, and then Bobby Brown was doing his own thing, but he had left the group a little bit before then. And then they all came back together. And it was supposed to be like this, you know, this big tour or whatever. So, sure. ex exactly. So then, so you had uh, Praz, who's not, who's one of the, one of the group, one of the members of the group that's not mentioned often, but he did release music solo, solely. So he did Ringo stuff the, out there. What happened? He's the Ringo. He's the Ringo of the group. I, I, I like I to call him the Ringo to, I hate to say group. that. I hate to say that. He he's, he's the Ringo star of the group. Ringo, Ringo star has songs. You know, I have movies to work as the main artist. People love I like the song Ghetto Superstar with Maya. That's the song I remember from him, help. and help that's the one me. I like. Hmm? Oh, I get by with a little help from my friends. That's his song. That's okay. That's his song. I love that. I love that. I love that. One song, if they allow him to play it, he could have his one song. And why Clef was busy um, in producing and writing. Uh, I love the song he did with uh, Mary J. Blige, 911. That was fun. He does the carnival. Does the carnival. Like Spraz back, and they have mm -hmm. the rap over Saturday Night Fever song. That was right. that was funny to me. Yeah, that I, was every yeah. time I would watch hear that, I would just laugh because I'm just like the BJs allowed this to happen. What? Oh, the BJs. <laughs> Hey, Beaches or Beaches was smart enough to let White Clef uh, at their catalog. I mean, why not? He was a golden child. There was a time when White Clef John was a golden child of Black radio. I mean, people forget that, but he had that touch. And, and here's something about it: he had it for Black radio. Now, yeah. there was another group which I mentioned briefly. There was another group that was a co-ed group that started out as hip hop that went pop the same way that the Fugees did. But they never really had a traditional black radio the way the Fugees did. Who is this? That was the Black Eyed Peas. The Black Eyed Peas had a singer, right? They had a female voice there. They when had- they, well, Stop, stop. When they first came out, it was just the three of them. But, the, but that's what I'm saying. I'm mm -hmm. saying initially we, you and I know that the Black Eyed Peas were hip hop. That's right. And when they got Fergie, and when they had that added that that song, that singing element to the group, they became this massive, you know, juggernaut. But they never had black radio. Never had black radio. They had pop radio. They never had black radio. Yeah. No, as I you mean, as you you know, and and you know what? Well, I am couldn't go to. Some artists, artists weren't African American artists weren't going to Will I Am and saying, oh. Ooh, can you help, help me out. You like, you know, I like a hit. I need a hit. But they could go to Wyclef. Couldn't they? <laughs> I mean, he had a touch, didn't he? He did. He did. And I mean, and I think had it. Yeah. So he's so that but I was getting ready to mention um of the three with uh the Fugees, this was the CD album, whoo, five, six Grammys. What's the CD? Uh, the Miseducation of Lauryn Hill, which for a, a, a long moment was like, this is, this is gold. I'm, I'm so sorry. It, it only went 10 times platinum. Wait a minute! Did you just say it only went ten times platinum? And the, only the, the, score, the score went twenty-two times platinum. It only went ten times platinum. No, this was an amazing feat for a young woman. I think I don't even think she was thirty at the time. 
th this was an amazing feat for her to win, I think, album of the year, song of the year, record of the year. It was, it was, it was a, it was over and over triumph, again. And I was and just kind of like, wow. Hmm? Triumph and it was her downfall. That and that, unfortunately. Insane. Yeah. I, I, I wanted her I, to come Michael back. Has the magic, having this magic touch. Certainly there was tension between the two of them you know, healthy or unhealthy tension between the two of them. She creates this thing independent of Wyclef. She creates this massive transformational like songbook, which is the miseducation of Lauren Hill without him. And it's kind of like, hey, I can do it too. I can, you know, I'm okay without you. Which she was. <laughs> totally. Completely. That's why I, I but think she I, did I, it about herself and she said she did and that's where the tension came out because Quest Love is, is much a part of what made the, the miseducation Laura Hill a success as Lauren Hill is. Okay. I know the X Factor might be talking about uh, Wycliffe and the downfall of the relationship, but I'm just saying, I don't know. That's yeah, just my own situation. But, I don't her know. Ego, but see, Mal, but her ego got so much into it um, that she began to kind of like, this was all her success. And it wasn't, it was so many elements that made that thing massive, right? I mean, D'Angelo, the song with D'Angelo was just- I forgot like about that ordinary. one. I mean, oh. she was, she had so many artists there oh. with her, Zion, you know, the song you mentioned about her, uh, uh, when we were talking previously, Zion, I was to her son. I mean, that, that guitar on there is Carlos Santana. It sure is. I was just I mean, about so, to mention that. I was just about to mention that, yeah. There's so many different elements to what made that success. It wasn't just her. And yeah. I think her animosity and attention she had with Wyclef kind of pushed her to want to say, like, I did this on my own, and she didn't. And that's why she could never repeat it, because she didn't do it on her own. In fact, it drove her kind of crazy. So in my, my point of view, it drove her crazy because I she would never do that again. I remember seeing her. Um, oh, there's a there's a concert. You can do free concerts. It's at Wingate in Brooklyn. And I want to say it was either 2003 or 2004. And we, we oh, we're going to go see Lauryn Hill. That show was so weird. I don't, I don't know if it, it just, something was off and we didn't, n none of us were just kind of like, she didn't sing any of her hits. That was number one. That was well, weird. Well, and well then, I mean, it's different. I don't, artists, artists can create things out of depression, but you may not want to see a depressed artist on the stage. And that's what we saw in Brooklyn at Wingate. And a, a, you, you saw a lot of people walk out of Wingate because we were trying, we were, we were yelling at the stage, ready or not, or um, X Factor, uh, do what thing. We want to hear what you're known for. And she said she just was very adamant about doing, I think, new music or music that she had been working on. And it wasn't received well. And they talked about it in page six in um, the New York Post the day afterwards. And I don't think she performed too much longer after that. And I think the last time that the Fugees were on stage was 2004. To wrap up, I know um, they are now back on tour. And the event that happened over the weekend, what was that called, Michael? It was Global Citizen, which is mm -hmm. a great organization. It's uh, kind of an NGO-like organization. It, instead of asking people for money, it asks people to support uh, causes through their um, raising publicity about things. Uh, right now, it's pushing, you know, vaccinations in right. countries that um, aren't getting as many as much access as we do have here in the U.S. Uh, political rights, human rights. It does that instead of saying like, "Give me money." It says like, you know, lend your support for this cause. So this is something right up the alley for the Fujis, right? a right. group that's based out of you know their Haitian American heritage Haiti of course being the place that is perpetually you know in, in, in disarray and distress uh, had a earthquake 
there not very long ago. And then after that, had his president or his, his political leader, you know, assassinated in a very just bloody way, just causing the country to go into even more chaos. So here come the Fujis to raise their voices for, you know, being a global citizen. So it's perfect, perfect venue for them. Um, Val, when you miss, what did you what did you hear? What did you hear from them on the stage? So I was able to see a YouTube clip of them performing Ready or Not. We've heard it, me and you, Michael. We've heard Ready or Not performed live. We've heard it a bunch several of times. Several times, in the, right? Several bunch times. Of, in the, yeah, in the yeah. Movies. And by live, I don't mean live on video. Like you and I were there in audiences. We were we were an audience. We we heard yeah. it. We we heard yeah. it. Over the um, weekend, so, we heard it by video them in New York. Right. But mm -hmm. when we heard or when I heard um, the YouTube clip and uh, they were in a very great, um, I want to say, uh, uh, outdoor auditorium that is literally in, in lower Manhattan. I saw yes, when they were yes, building exactly. that it was gorgeous. Mm -hmm. They they had these beautiful uh, 360 views of lower Manhattan in the skyline. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, I know exactly where that is. That's that's right in Battery City and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking and I'm hearing Lauren. And I'm going, she sounds a little distressed. Her, the key was weird at one point. I remember there was a part where the horns were playing and she asked them to play louder and they did. And, and we kind of noticed that uh, the music was playing louder than her vocals because maybe they were trying to cover her vocals. I don't. He was trying to cover her vocals. <sighs> and, then she, and, and then the parts that she rapped, she was singing and when she would sing them it was a little gruff and i was like her voice was always raspy i understand that i i that part i thought she sounded fine when she was supposedly rapping and began to break out in the song i think she was at a lower register a lower key and she was hitting those notes the notes that the song is written in like ready or not I don't know. I don't know if she can hit some of those notes anymore. I'm not sure. I mean, it's been like 30 years now. I don't know if she, her vocal ability allows her to do that. Well, she's she's not she's not 50. She's in her mid 40s. She's it, it's not that okay. you know. She was, I mean, she, she was a teenager when she came up. I I understand yeah, that. Yeah, I I, I totally understand that. But I, I okay. A different voice. I understand. Patty, for example, Patty LaBelle, I've seen her a bunch of times perform mm -hmm. live. Her voice, I'm just saying, I, I can I can count on Patty bringing Patty no, 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 in her no, voice, no, but no, I, you know, I'm just saying. No, 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 no. Don't, don't compare it to Patty LaBelle. Please okay. don't compare it to Patty LaBelle. And I love Bernie. Don't compare it to okay. Patty LaBelle. Patty LaBelle's voice, when we heard Patty LaBelle, when you and I had heard Patty LaBelle, she was a mature singer. Okay. She was doing that. You heard Lauren Hill back when she was a teenager, still straightened hair. She looked like she could have been an extra on the Cosby show coming out <laughs> on the stage. She is not mature. That was not a mature voice. And that's why she got booed. Mm -hmm. They had, you know, at the start of that song halfway in. Because it wasn't mature. It wasn't polished. It was really raw. Mm -hmm. Since then, she has become a more mature singer. But she didn't start out that way. And so I don't think we can judge her, her singing ability the same way. Well, I, well, we I will her say. Her pinnacle, and I think that was miseducation. And just like any like art story arc, you get your climax, and it's following action after that. Well, I, I want, I'm hoping. I'm hoping because I think she has. They have a couple of tour dates. The tour date that's going to bring like her 12. to the Midwest. First one is Chicago in one, November. November the second. November. November. They hit 2nd. Miami. They hit Los Angeles. They hit mm -hmm. London, and they have a couple of dates in Africa. Yeah. In, so. uh, Nigeria and Ghana, which I'm sure somebody's going. I'm. Mean, I, I know that's either going to Apple Plus or Apple, you know, or Netflix or somebody. I all I all I know is is that yeah, they make it that I'm far. that I'm gonna pray that they do and I know they're celebrating the 25th anniversary of the score, but I would like to hear and you have said this too, music from. I would like to hear music from here. 
I would like to hear the carnival. That's uh that's why Clef. I want to hear Ghetto Superstar by Prize. I want to yeah, hear Ringo can sing his song too. You um, calling that boy Ringo. <laughs> but, but if you gonna pay eight hundred dollars to see the Fuji, if you wanna pay eight hundred dollars, I think to celebrate the score, I think you gotta hear a little bit more than just the score. You gotta gotta hear all Not, of that. Vocab. I, I want gotta, your vocab. And I gotta hear more than 10, 10 brothers on horns drowning out Lauren as she tries to find the key. <laughs> and I love Lauren Hill. I do. She I she do is too. she's she's Marley royalty. I mean, she married into that family for better or worse. And for worse, I believe uh, she's they were never they were they were never married. I did my research. Look, she had a, seven babies, all right. So she is part of the Marley family. <laughs> Okay. She has that, created. That is, she has created Marley. Life. She has created family members. Let's do that. She created more Marley Marleys than Rita did. Okay. <laughs> so I think she earned it. <laughs> As the weekend would say, she earned it. Um, she earned it. So Sweet. I want to see them. I want to support them. But I've seen them. And, and I don't know what they would do differently. It doesn't look like anything. Well, how would they sound differently? I don't want, Val, I don't want the Fuji's to sound the same way they did in 96. To me, that's not either. progress. No. That's no. not good. I mean, I, no. I see, you know, my, uh, you know, older, you know, Caucasian friends, you know. I mean, they were up seeing the Rolling Stones to up till a month ago, right? Till... The Charlie died. They would go mm -hmm. spend a thousand dollars to see the Rolling Stones. Like, really? That's that's you think that's a good idea? Spend them, you know, fifteen hundred dollars to see the Eagles or Fleetwood Mac. Or it's like, okay, I guess you know. Well, I well the one thing I the one the one concert I regret not attending, and one of my friends got a chance to see see it was Prince at Essence. And she was like, it was well worth the ticket. You should have come down here. Because unfortunately, right. two years later, that's Prince right. was no longer with us. Okay. He but was that's down right. there in 2000. He was down there in 2014. Okay, but that's Prince. That is not, that's not the Lauren mm -hmm. Hill that we saw on video. Oh. And, and I got to say, that's all you got to, that's the only reason you see the Fuji. Okay. Oh, you see the Fugees because of Lauren oh, Hill. Forget the yeah. other two guys. You see Lauren. You see the Fugees because of I Lauren. Playing Hill. guitar, you, you you can find somebody play guitar. Okay, Prize is going like yeah. We'll do one more week. Blah, blah, blah. I can do that. I you, you, I like guitar. the three of them together. They're like a they're like a chord braided together, and they bring the each one of them brings their own flavor. One flavor is a little bit stronger than the other. But I like the three of them together. It, okay, it look, was a look, good. It when, when, good. when I knew people and they were saying like I, I paid a zillion and a half dollars to see the Rolling Stones, they ain't paying the same amount to, to see the, the the Stones without Mick Jagger. Okay, I gotta see Mick. Start me up. They're not paying it to see Keith just stand there and, and, and you know defy science by being still being alive. Okay, that's not the reason. They gotta hear Mick sing the song. Okay, the, the, the same way with with Fleetwood Mac. I mean, they tried to go out on tour once without Stevie Nicks. <laughs> that's that's laughable. Okay, I gotta hear Stevie sing with them. Well, I will say vocals. The vocals. The vocals of any group that is famous makes the group like. I know right now one of my favorite groups is they don't they no longer have their lead singer. I love Mint Condition, but Stokely is no longer with them. And I'm thinking, what are you without Stokely? Who who's gonna who's gonna do who's gonna do Pretty Brown Eyes for me when I go see but then, you guys? Yeah, but see, that's because the the band is established <laughs> around songs. The band isn't a band. That's diff. That's a difference there. Well, there's a difference there. I I think there's a difference there. Okay, well. Guys, put it in the chat. Which, <laughs> if you have a favorite song from the Fugees, we'd love to hear what it is. Put oh, it okay, here, hey, let me put it. Let me put it this way. Let me put it this way, Val. Okay, 
they can't get prize. Prize just 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 is busy, you know. So it's Lauren and Wyclef out. That's the Fuji's, isn't it? <sighs> You I'm going to fight. Feel, I'm going to fight for challenge? all members, all original members. I'm going to fight for that. I don't care how little as we as Michael. an audience might think that they contribute. I'm going to fight for the integrity of the group. You presented to me in 1994. Get now, together now, and come together. Please understand. I'm not saying that as he's not a member of the group. He is a member of the group. Ringo was an important part of the Beatles. Okay. He, he was very the important to the Beatles. He was very important to the Beatles. Fries was very important to the Fugees. Yes, he liked he to kept the Fugees around longer than they would have otherwise. He was the go between between Lauren like flipping out and Wyclef doing things to cause her to flip out. I mean, he was the in he was the intermediary. He was the go between. That's the reason he why he's people. important. He. His role was not necessarily on stage. It was off stage. You just said that. That's you what just... I, I did. I did because I, I, I don't want it to sound like I'm bashing him. I'm not sure. bashed. Him. But in terms of like listening to their music on stage performance, that's a two-person group. And really one of them shines more than the other. You got Mick and Key and you got Lower and, and Wyclef. <laughs> Mickey and Keith at the Stones, okay? okay. Well, but. so anywho, if you want to see the Fugees, if you're in um, the Midwest. You're in Chicago. Uh, if, you're, if you're in November Chicago, 2nd. they're coming November yeah, 2nd. My hill ticket now mm-hmm. is it's ranging from like 50 to $800. Mm-hmm. Now, hopefully by with that 800 number, Lauren will grace you with some other songs beyond what's on the score. Maybe Wyclef will play some music that, you know, you know from the 90s because he pretty much dominated at least three years of the 90s um, yeah. through his music and Praz will do his little song. So um, they're going to be a perf- with them. Yeah. They're going to be in Oakland on November 7th. Oh, uh, Inglewood, the form. I don't know if you guys are out in L.A. Uh, November 18th, they're in Atlanta, ATL. Uh, they actually go back home to Newark, New Jersey, November 26th. Oh, that's going to be crazy if they can make it to that show. If they could, yeah, I'm going to be excited that when that happens. Because everybody yeah, in Jersey will uh, come out for that, right? A lot of people probably would be there. I bet Redman would show up for that. I mean, all, uh, all, all Jersey royalty will show up for that. The situation. I mean, everybody. They're, they're going to be in D.C. on November 28th. And in that's December... I know. And in December, they go international uh, in France on December 4th. And on December 6th, they are in London. They can sound good live. This, when they did Smoking Grooves tour, they sounded great. I mean, they were a headline on that Smoking Grooves tour. And they had a lot of big names on it. I know. I know. Well, I, the, the, this tour is short. So I'm just hoping and praying no one gets COVID. Everybody stays safe. I'm just saying, because we we still out here with this this variant or whatever we got going on. Oh, they got it. And they got and they're able to they're able to do all of the we dates that are going. She, they'll be all right. Yeah, because we cause we are heard on all of the girl, Molly Magic. They'll be fine. Uh we are heard in every city that we just mentioned, with the exception of France. So uh, my friends London, over in London, yeah. hi. Blah, 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 cheerio. You go, blah, blah, cheerio. <laughs> Be nice, nice posh show. Nice posh and, show. And then, you know, my friends over in uh, Cali. You have friends in Cali, duh. Uh, I got love in Cali. You got love in Cali. California love. <laughs> and so, Michael, what's your name? My name is not Valerie Johnson, nor Wyclef John, nor Lauren Hill. <laughs> But your name is one of those three because this has been Interludes Extra celebrating the 25th anniversary of one of the greatest hip-hop albums ever made, The Score by the Fugees. I'm Michael Womble and you are Valerie Chunks. You guys check us out next week on Talk on Tuesdays. Have a good one.
Thank you for watching the Interludes Extra. Please like and subscribe to Interludes, our YouTube channel. I'm Val Johnson. Take care. <laughs>